thank you for uh, that you are here now today for this very important topic. I think we discussed it a lot already, SMEs met MEPs, but now the focus on the Southern Europe perspective on DSA. Um, I think this is always important that we are thinking also Europe is diverse. The problems and also opportunities are much more common, but sometimes it is also good to know that we have sometimes a different approach. We can learn from each other. And I'm very happy that uh, welcome and opening the host is today Alex Agio Saliba, member of the European Parliament, former rapporteur of the DSA, co-chair of SM Connect Digital Economy Working Group. I think you are really a good listener and exchanger with SMEs because uh, I think this is important that you're always in contact with, 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 the, with the reality out of the bubble. Okay, bubble is perhaps a little bit too extreme, but I have to say it is really to hear and to listen what is going on and what the needs of SMEs is. And uh, this is really the strong side. I have to say thank you always if we're asking you, you have an open ear and this is very important. And now I want to be short, giving you the floor for your welcome and opening. First, you were totally right when you spoke about this uh, European bubble, especially its predominance in the institutions. So for us, the work that SME connects uh, and, and these activities, online activities that you uh, created even during the pandemic, I think for us were really helpful because basically we were negotiating and drafting the pre-proposal for the European Commission and drafting and negotiating the position upon the Commission's proposal, which was issued last December during the pandemic, and therefore interactions with different key players within our society. And SMEs, uh, I believe, are key players when it comes to the discussion on the future of the internet, future of the e-commerce. Uh, so for us, the, the work and the discussions that you were moving forward directly with the stakeholders at SME Connect and more appropriately, more appropriately also today's discussion that basically we will be having um, with uh, a focus on Southern Europe, um, the realities of Southern countries such as Malta, Cyprus, Italy, Spain, Portugal, the reality for SMEs and SMEs which are interacting on the digital ecosystem, I think they are very peculiar. And definitely this discussion is very appropriate at this particular juncture when right now, uh, things are progressing really fast on the DSA. As I said on 15th of December of 2020, the commission nearly a year ago now, the commission has put on the table the Digital Services Act the proposal, the proposal which, in my opinion, was a good starting point. It was incorporating a lot of important elements that um, were part of the proposal of the European Parliament, uh, which I was spearheading as rapporteur within the Internal Market Committee when it comes to the uh, specific liability for online marketplaces, when it comes for the know your business customer provisions when it comes to the level playing field uh, between the offline and the online world, when it comes to other important principles such as the no present action mechanism, such as the principles that we move forward when it comes to the digital market sect and the extra liability which should be shouldered by the biggest players which are affecting more the ecosystem moving forward these regulations which ultimately would regulate big tech players which until a couple of months a couple of years ago were deemed to be untouchables within within the ecosystem and everyone was afraid to try to regulate them because they seem too big and too complex to to regulate and i think this is a great opportunity that we have on the table but we don't have a lot of opportunities to try and test with this legislation. So we have to bring it right uh, on the first attempt. This is not going to be a, a set of legislation which we can amend and we can basically bring to the table of discussions every year. 
the last division of the e-commerce directive came into being 21 years ago. So imagine uh, we are revising such a key piece of legislation, which is so fundamentally important, especially for our SMEs throughout, throughout, throughout the union, only 21 years after it came uh, into being. So imagine the fast developments when it comes to online platforms. I, I, I believe that 90, over 90% of the platforms that are so predominant in the lives of SMEs, of our citizens today, weren't even in existence 21 years ago or were at their very infancies. So uh, I think this is a great opportunity that we have, but we have to strike the right balance so that the interests of our citizens, the interests of our SMEs, of our businesses, whose interests depend so much on the dig digital ecosystem, these interests should be safeguarded. Uh, when it comes to the council, the proposal is also gaining traction and momentum. And when it comes to negotiations, I think that we will be having also a lot of interesting developments and conclusions also during the French presidency, which is putting a lot of focus when it comes to the digital agenda. And I think uh, the DSA would be the cherry on the cake if France uh, wants uh, Macron, especially uh, during, during election time, wants to make a statement uh, when it comes to the digital European policy. So things are moving fast. Uh, even in the European Parliament, uh, we are heading for a vote on the TSA to reach general agreement on the position of the European Parliament uh, on, the, on the Digital Services Act. So things are moving uh, in the right way, but these discussions uh, that we have today are important because as I said, TSA will be a game changer for you, will have a game changer, changer as much as the uh, G GDPR was a game changer, not only for you, but for the world, because the Digital Services Act will not be only a set of legislation which will condition the digital ecosystem within Europe alone, but definitely this will be leaving a huge impact also outside Europe and in other continents, because here we are dealing with one big international ecosystem. So if there is a change in Europe, definitely this change will be also felt uh, in other continents. Therefore, the responsibility that we have as European Union regulators, legislators, is um, very, very big on our shoulders. And as also Francis Hogan said in the hearing that we had last Monday in the Internal Market Committee, Europe has a great opportunity to be um, rule setter internationally, even when it comes to social media. The DSA is basically a bill that will impose new restrictions and a set of enforceable rules for online intermediate services, including platforms per se, platforms such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, Alibaba, and King.com, but also on companies which are cloud service providers, which are more technical in their nature, such as Amazon and also Dropbox, and also telecom companies, um, such as Telefonica, such as Proximus. The Digital, Digital Services Act is also pro proposing and seeking to modernize the rules governing online plat platforms practices, also when it comes to content moderation, and basically what actions are being taken online to remove content, to control content, the interaction also that um, this, this uh, moderation system have with uh, fundamental freedoms, fundamental rights. Again, as I said, this is a long awaited pro proposal, which will be also reinvigorating legislation, which is still relevant today, the e-commerce directive. I cannot come here today and say that the e-commerce directive is totally irrelevant for, uh, for, 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 for the ecosystem as it is evolving today. I think the e-commerce directive that we moved forward uh, as a European Union 21 years ago was very resilient. 
very resilient to basically withstand all the developments that we had during the past 21 years. Basic principles of the e-commerce directive are also being reflected uh, and reflected, not only just reflected, but reflected as core principles, core elements also under the DSA, such as the country of origin principle, such as the uh, liability fields, such as also the principle of banning also when it comes to uh, monitoring, certain monitoring of content. So a number of principles that we had under the e-commerce directive are still totally relevant and will also be incorporated under the current Digital Services Act. When it comes to SMEs, when it comes to SMEs, the DSA uh, basically is aiming to create a fair digital environment for around 25 million SMEs in Europe, SMEs which are the backbone and the engine for Europe's economy. And the question here is to help our SMEs in the DSA by regulating the severe shortcomings that we have uh, in the current regulatory framework and act uh, at the union level to address these identified difficulties and prevent them from happening and also from continuing at the EU level. And to do that, we should focus instead uh, of the barriers, I believe that we should focus more on the solutions. Solutions, for example, such as reinforcing the principle of what is illegal offline is also illegal online. Reinforcing the country of origin principle, the know your business customer provisions, which for me, I think these two parts in the Digital Services Act will be game changers for our SMEs. It will, it will pave the way for having more uh, higher level of competitivity for our SMEs to create, to create this level playing field for our SMEs, especially again, and I'm going to link with today's uh, discussion, especially, especially for those SMEs which are relay, reliant on the digital ecosystem and they come from southern member states, especially islands. Uh, so this, I think, uh, this, 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 these, these changes will bring a lot uh, of, of positive effects on our SMEs. The principle, for example, that third country companies must adhere with our rules when directing their services, when targeting their services directly for European, European consumers, directly targeting our consumers. And the current situation that we have, that European uh, distributors, European producers, they have to abide with strict technical regulations to be able to market their products inside the internal market. And with the ecosystem, the digital ecosystem that we have, we have a situation whereby third country uh, producers, distributors are targeting directly our market without adhering to these fundamental principles emanating from uh, the European Aki and therefore having, having also a competitive advantage over our European SMEs. And I think that these proposals, um, the level playing field for third country uh, producers, the know your business customer, uh, and also the principle of country of origin can help a lot, can help a lot to do away with this uncompetitive disadvantage that our SMEs, our distributors, our producers have been facing now for a number of years. This could be a game changer. That's why it's really important to look and focus on solutions rather than barriers when dealing uh, with the with the uh, digital services act. And I conclude on this point. We must recognize that a new holistic and common approach should be applied to the Dig digital services act. An approach built on trust, on choice, on a high level of protection, fully integrating our SMEs concerns. The DSA should also be an opportunity to help our SMEs to continue to grow, to continue to grow in the new digital realities that we have to live by. Thanks a lot, Horst, and I am looking forward for today's discussion. 
Thank you very much, Alex, for this excellent overview. I think also this message, really the focus on SMEs is great. Uh, I think fair competition is key. I think also that you are solution oriented. SMEs are pragmatic. They want to have solution. They want not to have only problems to hear or what, what it's due to. They want to see where the chances and also this rule setting and also that it's regulation is needed. And regulation means not, all, means not always trouble, it means also chances. Thank you very much. And now we're going directly to the European keynotes. This is always the first to give a little bit the, the, this perspective before we come into the regional debate. And we're starting with Alexis Varavka, Head Digital and Competitiveness Independent Retail Europe. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you to SME Connect and to MEP IU Saliba for hosting this uh, very good discussion. Uh, just maybe to present very briefly uh, my organization, uh, Independent Retail Europe. We are the European association that represents groups of independent retailers, cooperatives of independent retailers. Uh, we are bringing together 23 groups of independent retailers and their national associations representing uh, independent retailers who collectively provide uh, 6.6 .6 million jobs in Europe. And I will start actually by saying that it might be obvious, but to stay competitive online, SME retailers need a framework that both protect them from unfair competition, from non-new traders selling illegal goods, for instance, but at the same time, that framework should not put unnecessary obstacles for their groups. So we clearly welcome the, the Digital Service Act and the hurt of the Digital Service Act based on the notice and action mechanism, uh, the country of origin principle, the, the conditional exemption of liability. These are all very good principles that we clearly allow to fight illegal content might. But I still would like to raise three particular points which deserve some attention, we think, because it may undermine SME's ability to compete online if they are not handled properly. Um, the first one actually concerns the case of closed and, or internal platforms. The PSA has been conceived on the basis mostly of the traditional open third-party platform model where you have a business user anywhere in the world who can use a platform to reach any consumer around the world. That's typically the, the eBay or Amazon model. And most of the obligations under, under the DSA do make sense in that specific kind of, of uh, third-party platforms. However, the DSA, we think, fails to make a distinction between that model and the lower risk model of internal closed platforms, which have been developed by many groups of SMEs when they, they are cooperated together to sell in common. And in this model, uh, the platform is an internal platform, so it's owned and controlled by a closed group of SMEs. External traders are not allowed, and products are sold under the common brand of these of the SMEs. This is a typical model of groups of independent retailers and other cooperation of SMEs outside of the retail sector. And we clearly see that for this kind of specific internal closed setting, some of the obligations of the DSA are not really adequate, a bit unnecessary, and sometimes disproportionately burdensome. I'm speaking in particular about everything that relates to reporting obligations that can be very heavy, or also about anything that actually uh, interfere with the internal structure of such internal platform. So we believe that here in that case, uh, a lighter approach is certainly needed. Otherwise, the risk is to have a DSA that will only work for a large third party marketplaces and that would clearly distort the market in their favor and undermine SME's ability to compete online. This is a specificity that actually has been uh, recognized by the EPP group in the European Parliament through a number of amendments that recognize a specific internal closed platform model, uh, also in the ITRE committee of the European Parliament. So we definitely hope that as part of the final negotiations, this will be recognized by all political groups, the specificity, and that the light, lighter approach in light of the, the slower risk would be adopted for this specific internal uh, platform model. The second issue I'd like to raise is the, the specific case of potential new obligations for marketplaces. Uh, the DSA already tries to tackle, and rather well, um, the problem of illegal content in the horizontal context. So not only in the case of, of the sales of goods, but other kinds of possible illegal activities. But the question is arising in the discussion in the parliament and also in the council, whether there is a need to have additional obligations specifically to address illegal products on marketplaces. And there I would like to, to stress a bit that the DSA is a horizontal legislation. And we can wonder whether this is the right place to have a more sectorial approach to, to product safety, 
especially when you have uh, an ongoing revision of the general product safety directive and a coming revision of the product liability directive that are certainly very good instruments and sector specific instruments that should allow to tackle more precisely the problem of illegal products sold on marketplaces. Lastly, and I will conclude with something which is certainly one of the hottest topics of the moment uh, in the European Parliament, targeted advertisement. SME retailers are extremely worried about any possible restriction or even a ban on targeted advertisements in the Digital Services Act. While there are certainly concerns to be addressed about the use of targeted advertisements in some contexts, for, for instance, the political context, where we can all agree that it may lead to some issues. However, restricting the use of uh, targeted advertisements in the case of the legal uh, sale of legal products could seriously harm SMEs. Targeted ad is absolutely necessary for SME retailers to reach potential new customers with a relevant advertisement in a cost-effective manner. Uh, there is a recent study from Deloitte that showed that about 76% of SMEs using targeted advertisements reported that it's actually effective to find new customers. It's a level that you don't see with other means of advertisement. And since SMEs do not have large advertisement budgets, we fear that any restriction, restriction on target ad would simply impair their ability to advertise efficiently and find new customers. They simply cannot afford the less effective alternative means of advertising. So to conclude, and not being too long, um, although SME retailers are very positive about the DSS ability to tackle illegal content, we fear that some of their specificities are not always well taken into account currently. And lighter obligations under uh, Chapter 3 of the DSA might probably be needed for the closed or internal types of platforms that are sometimes operated by cooperatives or SMEs. These kind of, of, of platforms should not be assimilated as third party marketplaces. Moreover, uh, additional obligations for marketplaces, we believe that they should certainly be dealt with with specific legislation dealing with product safety and maybe not in the DSA, which is not meant specifically for that. And lastly, I would certainly invite all policymakers uh, in the European institutions to fully reflect on the possible consequences on the ban or a restriction of targeted advertisement in the context of the legitimate sale of legal and safe products, because such a move will certainly harm SME's ability to compete online. So I will stop here to, to try not to be too long, and I really look forward for a very good discussion with all the speakers and the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, for this very clear message. I think you showed there are good things from your point of view and, and bad things, and they are really both in the pocket. We have to be careful. SMEs are sometimes uh, forgotten in this in these discussions, and and I think this is to pointing out this that this. Uh, not only about the bigs, it's me talking too much about the bigs, we're talking too less about the small ones. And now we're coming to the next uh, speaker, Johan Barata, in the Medarian Liability Fellow, Cyber Policy Center, Stanford. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, apologies for looking like a person who's in a witness protection program, but uh, I'm in, in, a, in a corner at the, at the lounge in, at an airport, so I had to I, I have to keep uh, the, this this my mask. But I think that it, you, you you can hear me properly. So thanks thanks again for for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the issues of liability and the way uh, liability is regulated. Uh, by, the, by the DSA, um, uh, kind of following up on the way the, the liability, intermediary liability has already been regulated and contemplated by the existing legislation and case law. I mean, the, the first thing I think it is very important to underscore is that intermediary liability exemption uh, is uh, considered to be um, the, a legal principle that is the legal principle that is most compatible with the development of uh, the free development of e-commerce and also with uh, the, the, the legal principle that is 
the most compatible with the need to protect freedom of expression, for example, in the, in the online world. This is the reason why we find this principle in international human rights standards. I also refine it in the, the famous section 230 of the Communication Decency Act in the United States and also in the e commerce directive. In the e commerce directive, I mean, truth is that the, the idea, the principle of liability, intermediary liability exemption, is a condition. Uh, it's not absolute, it's based on two conditions the fact that the intermediary doesn't have effective actual knowledge of the illegality and once uh, knowing it uh, acts expeditiously. Uh, it's been challenging uh, in the course of the last years to really identify uh, which circumstances make and open, allow us to consider that an intermediary has actual knowledge um, because he has played some sort of an active role when it comes to moderating handling content. And as a matter of fact, the court has been using this idea, this distinction between active intermediaries and passive intermediaries. And uh, it has said that intermediaries enjoy these exceptions in as much as they perform a role of a mere technical, automatic and passive, passive nature. Mm -hmm. um, also, it considers that intermediaries may lose their, their benefit, they may lose their liability exemptions when they do things such as filtering, selecting, indexing, indexing, organizing, cataloging, aggregating, evaluating, using, modifying, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, apart from, from the case law that is not 100% clear uh, in, in most of the cases, we also need to note the fact that this is the e-commerce is a directive contrary to the to the DSA. So national courts have had the chance to, to also have their own interpretations and also national legislation. And these interpretation are these interpretations are not necessarily homogeneous. So at this point, perhaps one of the, the shortcomings of the e-commerce directive is the fact that based on these distinction that is not 100% clear, uh, we wouldn't say that uh, intermediaries feel particularly protected uh, when they engage in certain moderation activities that at the end of the day may be aiming at protecting users, particularly when we are talking about marketplaces, for example. Uh, then the question here is, does this change within the context of the DSA. The DSA incorporates something interesting, which is Article 6, that some have been, that some have compared it with the so called Good Samaritan Clause uh, coming from America. The center, the Good Samaritan Clause in the famous Section 230 says that intermediaries are not liable for the measures that they take with regards to content moderation. They are exempted. Uh, this is a way, of course, to incentivize precisely uh, content moderation. Um, but Article 6 has a very particular, let's say, language that says that intermediaries may not lose their liability protections solely because they carry out voluntary own initiative investigations or other activities aimed at detecting, identifying, and removing or disabling access to illegal, illegal content. Here we have this advert solely you know, that uh, of course opens the door to several types of interpretation. You know? And uh, let's say that solely in these cases probably needs to be uh, interpreted in the sense that if intermediaries engage in other activities, if there are other elements that may take the judge or the regulator to the conclusion that they had actual knowledge uh, of the illegality, then they still become uh, liable. So here we see two layers. Huh? One layer is the existing layer of the distinction passive active that, that is still in place. And then on top of that, we see the, 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 the adoption or the incorporation of a very limited Good Samaritan clause that still, I believe, does not suffice to, to 
properly consider that intermediaries are protected, are provided the stimulus to really protect the users by actively engaging in certain content moderation, content moderation practices. So it's a, some sort of a weak Good Samaritan close. Uh, I think that this is something that still uh, needs to be polished within the context of, of the DSA, because I think that, that the, the language is pretty much open to, to, to interpretation. Also, I've seen that some of the, of the amendments suggest to incorporate certain elements included in the recitals in the text of the articles in order to make them a little bit more clear, but still there are many things that in my, in my opinion uh, uh, remain, uh, let's say, still need to be clarified. What are the, my, my main concerns looking into some of the, the amendments in this field? First thing is that, uh, let's say, uh, Article 6 protects certain initiatives vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, uh, preventing or eliminating illegal content. The problem is that the elimination of, sorry, the definition of illegal content is still very much open. I mean, we need to understand, of course, and that this is a definition. I mean, the identification of illegal content will be made by national law, but the way this is also presented in the DSA may open the door, for example, to doubts such as, are we talking about illegality that needs to be, let's say, determined by platforms? Are we talking about illegal content because it has already been declared illegal by a competent authority? Are we talking only about cases where the legality is absolutely obvious huh? uh, for, for anyone? Huh? This is something that's still not clear. For example, are we talking about when we, we are talking about the videos that describe illegal content or illegal activities? Is that illegal content as well? I've seen different attempts to be define legal content, but many of them present uh, certain problems. Also, I don't think it's a good idea to connect liability exemptions with due diligence obligations. I think that due diligence obligations established in the DSA uh, go beyond preventing illegal activities. Huh? Due diligence obligations sometimes refer to content that it's not illegal, but it is harmful within the society. So connecting liability exemptions to the respect or to the fact that platforms may be really, really fulfilling their obligations when it comes to due diligence doesn't look particularly consistent, but I've seen some, some proposals. Also to connect liability exemptions with algorithms, with the use of algorithms or the fact that platforms don't use algorithms. I think that this looks this doesn't look realistic. In some cases, own initiatives, as mentioned in Article 6, and the own initiatives that are mentioned in the articles that refer, for example, to risk assessment, they require the use of algorithms. Uh, I, I think that, of course, it's not good to impose the obligation of using algorithms, but the use of algorithms doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem reasonable that using algorithms per se may deprive uh, intermediaries from their, uh, may, uh, from, from their liability exemptions. Um, and also, I think that, for example, amendments that introduce certain exceptions to content moderation, for example, protecting certain types of media, they, they trigger issues of interpretation of the scope, uh, also discriminatory treatment, and for also, I mean, I've noticed uh, that the issue of notices, huh? the notices that may trigger actual knowledge still are not properly described, uh, properly regulated in order to make sure that the notices that may trigger liability are only those that are properly substantiated and are those that really, really confer actual knowledge to, to, to intervene. So very quickly, because I mean, this is a very complex topic. And I think that there are several things that need to be, I wouldn't say change, but that, they, that need to be polished in the DSA huh, in order to make sure that we have the best possible system in a very complex area. I think that these are the things that I wanted to particularly outline at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's very important to polish things 
legal uncertainty is especially for SMEs a huge problem because uh, then to be in trouble or to compensate, uh, yeah, this is really, uh, I think what we have to keep in mind in past legislation was always often, not always, often a problem. And now we come directly to the regional debate and I have the pleasure to welcome Dana Farugia, CEO TechMT PPP between government of Malta and Chamber of Commerce of, of Malta. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, MEP Alex Ajusaliba, for inviting me. And uh, I'm very happy to be discussing this topic today, which is vital to, to SMEs, both locally and uh, as an EU block. We have prepared some slides, which I would like to share with you today um, uh, in order to proceed on our debates. I don't know whether you're seeing the, the presentation. Yes, we see it. All right. As a way of introduction, I would like to introduce TechMT, which is the entity, as you rightly so presented, um, uh, established jointly between the government of Malta and uh, the Malta Chamber of Commerce in order to promote technology um, growth on our island. Now, this is a very controversial topic because obviously technological growth uh, is related to SME business and large business performance, but also very importantly on our island, consumer protection. That is, that is vital to our ecosystem and uh, we are doing everything in our power in order to have these concurrently um, uh, addressed together with education. In fact, we're responsible of promoting the, the sector, of providing talent to the sector, um, uh, seeking innovation both internally in our country and also from abroad for indirect investment and assisting the sector to grow and assisting the sector to, to grow also through initiatives such as the Digital Single Act and its applications. Um, we have seen an increase in online platforms significantly, especially the COVID pandemic has catapulted us all online without obviously having a choice in reality, because people who have not had access to online platforms have be become um, emarginated and uh, this can be noted as well in the annual report on European SMEs of last year that there was a 16% of 16% of respondents who reported that they are going to invest in e-commerce and online marketing and that resulted in, temp in a 10 percent increase over the previous year which was 2019 the digital services act what what it means to us um, as malta we're happy to see that it keeps insisting and stressing the importance for startups to participate fully towards the digital ecosystem Whatever we do, whatever initiatives we, we invest in as a block in order to, uh, to optimize our, our SME performance, our large enterprise performance and consumer protection, we must keep in mind that uh, we should enforce but not stifle performance. And also the DSA needs to continue helping SMEs to find the right financial and human resources to integrate themselves with digital technology. As uh, Alexis uh, Walafska previously was, was mentioning, SMEs lack financial resources compared to other companies and also human resources due to costs and also um, vitally access to research and development, access to data. So uh, we're happy to see that uh, the DSA is seeing that SMEs reach as much as possible a broad consumer base and on the other hand, um, it, it uh, promotes the right use of tools for consumers to benefit from wider products and have a wider choice. Um, but we keep stressing also on our part the importance to keep the opt-in um, option in relation to targeted ad advertising. Reason being that for the cohort of the SME uh, segment, sharing of information and sharing of practices and sharing of consumer data is obviously vital to be as much um, cost effective as possible. Obviously, I cannot stress enough the importance of the G GDPR and uh, the regulations related to GDPR must be clear and must be very strict. 
It is not just about empowering SMEs, but it is always also about um, protecting the consumer, pr protecting uh, the citizen. Building on its strengths, Europe needs to continue to implement digital policies that empower people and businesses to work towards a sustainable and more prosperous digital future. And sustainability is something that as well here yeah, we're taking very seriously. We have obviously in the past years through different practices improved a lot when it comes to the green economy and sustainability, but this does not come at uh, a cheap cost, especially to SMEs. Thus, again, data sharing is of vital importance. The benefits of having online presence, obviously, this is this is something which is which we cannot even um, give a tangible value to. Selling online and having a global presence allows businesses the luxury of tapping into a wider pool of potential customers. And coming from an island state and coming from um, an island which is predominantly small. This is obviously crucial. Online data can help businesses as well to drive their companies into optimizing their current processes and sell more efficiently. And again, as an island state, we do export a lot of our services and we do that online. Online, going online, having a digital presence has become of uh, utmost importance um, uh, for, for our businesses. And uh, we're trying to implement as much incentives as possible from a cost-effective perspective in order for businesses to be able to transition from manual to digital as seamlessly as possible. Consumers obviously have a wider choice at their fingertips when their businesses are online. And statistically, it is proven that consumers purchase more when shopping online. Shopping baskets are predominantly bigger when compared to manual shopping. And this is something that uh, we have been obviously um, uh, trying to, 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 to educate our uh, business, business community because our economic sectors, apart from technology sector, are not as digitally savvy as our technology sector. However, with that comes great responsibility, again, of protecting the consumer. And finally, as assistance with regards to our entity and why, what is the purpose of, of Tech.MT, um, um, we try to handhold and assist through industry and technology specific research and studies SMEs to reach their goals. Obviously, this is something that we try to do at a national level. We appreciate the costs again of going through research, so we try to do that ourselves, especially in niche markets such as e-commerce and the Internet of Things. Because of the low adoption in our economic sectors um, in, uh, in, digit in digital presence, we had to obviously start educating and start researching the benefits of e-commerce. And uh, we have seen a shift in mentality in the past two years, and uh, as well on Internet of Things, we had to start to educate even our, our, our society, our, our ecosystem about the term itself. But with all this comes um, obviously further and increased use of digital tools and obviously um, for businesses, greater access to consumer behavior. And again, um, we need to keep both in mind when taking into consideration regulations or even restrictions. And we, are, we also encourage students to take up STEM subjects and instill leadership, innovation, and creativity um, uh, in, in these students because they are the future of our economic um, performance going forward. And we proactively reach out to businesses to listen and uh, in order to to be able to understand what they are going through. And I believe that in general, from, from uh, a feedback perspective, the DSA is uh, hitting positively on much of the requirements locally that uh, we have as a country. However, um, as an island state, again, we should remove as much bureaucracy as possible, even through the DSA if possible, um, in order to share more resources, be it financial, be it research, be it human resources, be it uh, burden sharing even, 
um, and also cross-border transactions of different parts. This brings me to the final slide. Thank you very much. And I hope um, uh, we can take this discussion even further to the benefit of our, obviously, SMEs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, yes, you pointed it out. I think uh, to implement means also to educate the SMEs, to find and to educate also the consumers uh, and, and, and inform them. And I think we should not only to discuss how we regulate digitalization, so how to make it a chance for SMEs and a chance also for consumers, because they have also, if more competition is good for the business, it's good also for the consumers, they have the benefits. And also a special situation of islands, I think, of course, we want to have an internal market. It means cross go cross border and to grow. Now we're going to Spain. Paula Lopez Ortiz, Director of Legal and Institutional Affairs, EIB. Sp uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for bringing us to this very important conversation for for bringing IAB voice. Let me just explain briefly what, what, what is IAB. IAB is, um, Spain is part uh, of the IAB Europe network. And our focus is to promote the, the invest in digital advertising and trying to make it grow, uh, so to say in a robust and unsustainable way. I think uh, today, uh, we all uh, agree uh, on the necessity uh, to adapt the rules to this digital era and to bring more transparency uh, on the alg algorithms and the decision making processes. Uh, all of us agree that transparency and empowerment of users have, are of utmost importance, but from IAB, and uh, it has been mentioned uh, before in, in, this, in this meeting, um, we are quite worried uh, with the voices that claims to ban personalized advertising. Uh, we need, uh, for, from IAB, uh, our colleagues from across Europe, we are trying to, to, to explain, trying to, to, to speak with, with, with uh, the regulators, to explain that um, Advertising, advertising has nothing to do with disinformation. Advertising has nothing to do with uh, political uh, uh, approaches. And for example, uh, the digital advertising industry uh, has, uh, has been working for, for the past uh, three years in what we, are, what we call transparency and consent framework. This is a, a, a very robust framework in which all the ecosystem uh, from buyers to sellers and all, all the ad tech in between uh, is uh, compromised uh, to, to comply some policies that includes not, uh, not uh, to work with political advertising, not working with uh, special sensitive data, not working with uh, data of uh, minors. So uh, the whole industry, including I, I, the whole picture is a compromise uh, in, in taking care of, of this. So I think that we need to separate uh, very carefully uh, these, two, uh, these two issues. And uh, we think that, uh, for example, uh, banning uh, digital uh, personalized advertising uh, wouldn't have uh, very much uh, practical effects um, because uh, in the end, uh, the media is uh, needs to monetize the, their content. So if it is not personalized advertising, it could be another kind of um, advertising that uh, will have less revenues uh, to, 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 to this media. Uh, so I think that uh, th this is important to, to, to take in, into account. And in IAB Europe, um, they have published uh, a very interesting study by Daniel Knapp, it is uh, he, their uh, chief economy officer, uh, that well takes into account uh, the multiplier uh, uh, effect uh, of the advertising for different uh, sectors. And one of the most important ones is the effects on uh, SMEs and, and how it goes and how it helps uh, SMEs uh, to, to, to grow. Because um, as, as many of you have been uh, telling, um, it, enab it enables the proliferation of, of, of this kind of uh, small companies. And it has been considered by the European Commission like the backbone of the European economy. So we need to take care of, of this. 
um, from a very um, advertising point of view, uh, this personalized advertising helps uh, these companies, the semi SMEs, and also startups to minimize the spend and to reach relevant consumer and measure uh, uh, the return of advertising investment. And this is particularly uh, important for uh, smaller businesses that often operate, operate uh, on much tighter budgets than the, the, the bigger companies. And also has been said uh, before, but due to this pandemic, the consumer behavior has shifted to, to e-commerce. So it, uh, it needs, uh, the, the, the SMEs needs to, to, to be there and needs to personalize their products. Uh, I, would, uh, I could stay like, uh, I, I could give much uh, uh, examples of uh, small and medium enterprises that are um, um, working with new products, with local products that need to personalize this advertising in order to uh, focus on, on their target. Uh, going, going to Spain, here is especially important because uh, in, in Spain, the SMEs represent more than 99 of companies and they employ ab uh, about 70 of the country workers. So the, the importance of the SMEs in Spain has been recognized uh, by, the, by, by our government and they have published like, uh, well, they have published the, the digital ag agenda um, and the purpose of, of this agenda is to encourage SMEs to, to, to be uh, in the digital sector and uh, for that is, it is uh, very important, the, the advertising. Um, so, well, uh, in the end, uh, the, the, the benefits of target advertising, it, it is not just limited uh, to selling products and services. Um, also, uh, the governments worldwide have uh, also used this target advertising to spread uh, public messages uh, regarding the health. So, and also we have to be in, in, uh, in mind uh, that uh, target advertising is already regulated by the data protection regulation. It's, uh, it has uh, its legal basis. Uh, it, is, uh, it already um, covers um, the, the legal basis to process data to offer the users uh, this kind of products and also the, um, the, the transparency um, uh, needs. So what we always say uh, in, uh, in IEB is that we are in front of a very sophisticated debate. It is a technical debate, a humanist debate. It, it has uh, many edges. Uh, we think that it, should, it shouldn't be a political uh, debate. And uh, it is necessary to, to approach this subject with sensitivity and with no uh, platitudes. Um, very important to separate this, uh, this debate on transparency algorithms uh, from the advertising. And uh, yeah, and, 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 and yeah, and, and of course, uh, we, if, if we finally and not hopefully uh, approve this, 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 this approach, uh, could have a very huge impact on, 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 on this uh, backbone of, of the European economy. And I think I have uh, already spoken uh, uh, and give some ideas in order to, to, to start the debate. I'm happy to share uh, more information of, on our approaches. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the Commission, you are not alone. I think Margaret Westhager was saying this also uh, that, that target ads are important for SMEs. So there are different voices from the Commission. So I, I think we, we it's always not black and white. There's many gray shades. And now we're coming to our last uh, uh, speaker, Fernando Pereira. Business Director Sapo from Podcal. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Horst. Um, uh, so uh, I would like to talk a little bit. First of all, I would like to to thank uh, the other panelists because they uh, made made my 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 job much much easier because they they approached uh, several uh, sides of the digital service acts um, discussion. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, point out uh, the the main worries about a small country like Portugal. Um, I, I would like to 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 stand out that 95 percent plus of our companies are SMEs. 
So uh, we, uh, we, if uh, the SMEs are the backbone of Europe, uh, I would say that is uh, they are almost 100% of the, the way the business is made in, in private sector in Portugal. And uh, we, we, we tend to, to, to agree with uh, Mr. Saliba when he said that uh, this, uh, this um, uh, legislation has been uh, running very, uh, has been uh, being uh, developed very fast. And uh, uh, sometimes when it goes uh, faster than it should, uh, there, are, there can be uh, some mistakes. And one of our main worries uh, regards the, the same subject that uh, Paula points, point, pointed out. Uh, we believe that the, the, the ban of target advertising will, will be uh, very, um, will damage uh, the, the way the, the business are made in, in Europe and uh, or around the world. And particularly, it will uh, withdraw the, the, the capability of SMEs to address uh, global markets. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it, will, it will bring the advertising industry back to uh, 20 years ago, uh, when digital was just starting and the contextual was the, the main way uh, to, to make uh, 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 to make uh, communicate uh, advertising more efficient, um, and uh, uh, the the main reason, the main question that I would like to 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 stand out is uh, why the target advertising uh, banning tar target advertising is needed uh, because right now the industry is showing us that uh, we have been doing. Uh, uh, going on the right direction with uh, GDPR, we uh, and that kind of regulation is being adopted uh, in other in other uh, in other countries like the United States, Brazil, etc. Uh, and uh, right now, the 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 power is give is being more and more given to the to the consumer. Uh, so the industry is, is uh, along with the regulators, are finding the right path to to uh, to go on the right direction. Just banning uh, uh, the target advertising uh, as a as a, 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 a made decision would jeopardize the what we strongly believe it's the right way to which is the the open web approach uh, and uh, it will damage uh, the media businesses but mostly the the smes that need this kind of uh, of uh, tool uh, to make happen their business so this is what i would like to stand out i would like to thank you once again for the opportunity and uh, make myself available to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, target ads, it seems to be very important. Now we have a short, because one hour is always short, a short round to the table. Uh, if you wanted to come up now, uh, what should be now the clear message? Is this in the, in, in the things? What we would, Alexis, what you would say now after this feedback, uh, if you have now 30 seconds additional, what is, what is the lesson, what, the, what should be done now? Changing all amendments? And so no, no, I, would, I would really cautious, uh, be cautious. I would warn basically MEPs and uh, the council not to see everything through the angle of large online platforms. There are very fortunately many, many other types of other small types of platforms. Third party, closed ones, but also many others. Be careful not to over regulate those ones. I, I would, this is, that would be my message. No. And then also to Dana Farugia, um, if you see you have a very, um, what is very good, uh, the consumer pro, it's, um, focus, how, if you say education is, the, is, is and, and clear education is the key and, and simple regulation of the uh, would be helpful for SMEs. 
you thinking that the ideas are going in this uh, in this direction? We heard that there is some legal unclarity there. Uh, do we need more time for for this regulation? Obviously, that's that's what I was referring to. Um, uh, it should incorporate um, uh, the education part and uh, um, uh, the consumer part, but obviously, um, it should not be rushed if needs to be. If we need to revisit on the DSA, um, uh, we can we can see the launch of other aspects of it, and and on that particular aspect, we can conduct maybe further research to implement something that is more relevant um, both to consumers and also to SMEs. As Fernando was saying, SMEs will tend to suffer if we rush, if our decisions are rushed at this point. Um, maybe they are based on, on emotions and uh, on, on certain anger that has arisen in the, in the past months related to the behavior of certain tech, tech giants. We shouldn't rush because it's the SME market who will suffer. And uh, all of us know that our economies are made up predominantly of SMEs. I think this is very important because if you hear it's related with elections or in France, it makes it, uh, if it's had such an impact also on businesses, uh, like, like also from the digital ad sectors, Paula Ortiz, do you know how many SMEs are clients in, in these fields? Are there the majority who are using digital ads? What is the part the marketing chairs there? Do you have numbers? Um, uh, in, 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 from my part, no, I don't have Paula Ortiz, but if you have... Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, then I go ahead uh, as, as I, I don't know... Uh... I, I don't know. I, I don't have a number of uh, how many. So I think I, I don't I, think I, it is researched yet in a, in a, on our island. I, I think. I thought it means, but this I think this is then also if we come into this discussion, if we go out in the blue and we have no numbers, I think this is really a, a dangerous. Dangerous. Thing. Yes, exactly. If policies. If you don't know what is the impact of SMEs, and we have an SME test. And the SME test is not working, and we are deciding things. Um, but uh, also, Mr. Barata, um, if you would add this now in these conversations, are we too fast? And do we don't we know too less? And we want to make now a decision where we have to say, not an entrepreneur would make a decision without data. Please. Yeah, well, this is exactly what, what I, I was going to mention. First of all, I think that we still need to improve the knowledge about the different types of platforms that exist and the different types of intermediaries that exist. And um, the second thing is that this gradual approach that is already present in the DSA, which is something very important, needs to be uh, improved. I mean, there's some gradual approach, it's true, but uh, but I think that this, uh, this gradual approach still needs to be adapted to the specificities of certain types of, of platforms. And also, perhaps, I mean, there are some um, kinds of services that now are trying to be introduced via amendments that perhaps they shouldn't be, for example, the instant messaging, uh, I mean, the, the commercial instant messaging platforms, etc. That is something that I mean, I have some doubts about. It. And a final remark, I mean, the, the DSA and the provisions of the DSA will not only have impact on SMEs in Europe, it's clear that many provisions included in the DSA may have extraterritorial impact uh, outside uh, the, the, European, uh, the European Union. So this is something that we also need to keep in mind. Thank you very much. And now the last question to Fernando. Um, if you, what is your feeling for the DSA? If you feel you're uncertain, what is in the future? What are you expecting? What would be the most negative impact for your business? Well, is there, is there a positive chance where you say, great, it's coming? What is the best of DSA there and what is the worst? Uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I, I believe that uh, we, we, we feel a little bit like uh, it's the beginning of 2018 when we were expecting GDPR to be implemented. It's, uh, it's a, a very big question mark 
where we we have uh, several our businesses mostly conducted of course with portuguese companies but also with uh, with global uh, companies and we also have some marketplaces that addresses uh, the relationship between uh, uh, companies and consumers uh, and uh, as everyone was was saying things are moving so fast that uh the the impact is a very a very big question mark and uh, we we the only the only effort that we are making is to make uh, legislators uh, aware that the uh, this kind of speed can make can go uh, wrong very very uh, for 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 most of the people and uh, most uh, and uh, particularly to the to the to the wrong targets of this of this legislation because this legislation is i believe it's um, meant to regulate the the activity of big techs but it can damage most the the small business and the local business uh, of Europe. Thank you very much. I think this is a very uncertain thing. I'll say one last question and you can make a short. Is the DSA now at the moment for in the benefit for SMEs more or the benefit for, for large companies in the end? Not about, about big tech. What is now, who has the best perspective on this? Alexis, what do you say? SMEs are, come, are better protected by or promoted by DSA or, or, be, or big companies? I don't think there's a clear cut answer to that. There are some oh. provisions in DSA that will protect SMEs, uh, protect them from unfair competition with illegal products, clearly, protect them with know your business customer to make sure that only uh, regular traders are on, on the platform. So there are some good things in DSA, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But it is true that it's a little bit of a helicopter view that has been taken, as was actually uh, mentioned before by other speakers. And maybe there's a need for more gradual approach and more. Uh, gradual uh, analysis of the type of businesses and how the, each obligation should apply to these types of businesses. So yeah, still a lot of work to do, I'm, I'm afraid. Thank you. Dana, you would to say benefit for SMEs or, or, or large companies to DSA now at the moment? I think in general, I mean, it tries to be as inclusive of course as possible. But as I said before, um, the DSA should focus more on including the data sharing and the research uh, finding sharing. And this comes obviously from the large to the small because the large have bigger budgets. They have more resources and more access to this data. Mm, I see. Johan, who is the winner? SMEs or, or, or large companies? Well, I think that large companies uh, will benefit from the kind of regulation that these regulations that are established by, by, by the DSA, because at the end of the day, uh, these kind of regulations that tend to be a little bit strict and impose many, many obligations, at the end of the day may uh, incorporate or may create entry barriers uh, and avoid avoid competition. That is something that, I mean, the big platforms are trying to, to avoid. So as a matter of fact, I think it's very important to look into this from this angle as well. Then, Fernando, last word, as an entrepreneur, are you a winner or you are not a winner of DSA? Uh, I think I'm, the, I'm on the loser side. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope, uh, then, then I think, we will, want, we will have to close now and I have to say, we hope SMEs are the winners. In fact, we want to win together. The society wants to win, the consumer wants to win. If you have all benefits, SMEs, large companies, we want to grow, have jobs, want to have data protection and we want to use technology also in the future. Thank you very much. See you till the next time. 